Thank you very much. We are here to bring you the story behind the music you love and to present an informal and easy-to-understand discussion of music and its interesting personalities. And today we're fortunate in having help us to add another page to your symphony scrapbook, Dr. Eric Oberg, president of the Orchestral Association. Uh, Dr. Oberg, when we had the pleasure of an interview not so long ago, there were a number of interesting uh, items open up for discussion that we didn't have time to uh, pursue, and uh, I wondered if you'd be good enough to try to follow that, uh, those along the interesting track of music today. Uh, for example, you pointed out in our previous interview that uh, both uh, Theodore Thomas, who founded the Chicago Symphony, and uh, the late Dr. Frederick Stock, his successor, uh, introduced a number of uh, compositions to the to this country, compositions that have now uh, joined the list of uh, classic works. And the question I'd like to uh, throw at you at the beginning is this. Does the contemporary conductor uh, face the same problem in presenting new works, by, that is, works by contemporary composers, that Thomas and Stock did in their day? Yes, he faces the same problem. In fact, he faces a somewhat more difficult problem because the introduction of the 12-tone scale and the apparent uh, surfeiting of present-day uh, composers with the methods that were used in the Romantic 19th century and their search for new methods makes their music a good deal harder to take for ears unaccustomed to taking that music. And uh, it throws the burden on the conductor not only of having to prepare works which may be dissonant and have unusual rhythmical combinations in them, but it also uh, makes it difficult for him to project emotionally, because after all, music must have an emotional appeal to the audience, so if the audience responds to it as it should. I think it must have been much more easy to respond uh, to Wagner, let us say, even though he was very new in his day, uh, because of the fact that he still used the same harmonic values and uh, very much the same dynamic and rhythmic values that his predecessor to, has, had used. But nowadays, composers are constantly searching for something entirely new and different, and that makes uh, their music a little hard to take, and anything that's hard to take is difficult for the doctor to administer, you might say, if you want to call the conductor the doctor who administers the pill. Uh, looking at it from a slightly different uh, angle, uh, would you say that uh, Thomas and Stock had, in a way, a greater difficulty because they were uh, facing a public uh, which was not at all accustomed to symphonic music? They were really pioneers in their way, weren't they? And while the audience today has a wider background of knowledge through the last 50 years, accumulated during the last 50 years and through radio and recording and so on, would that make a difference? No, I don't think it makes very much difference. In fact, I'm not willing to admit that today's audience has had 50 years of experience because today's audience is, compa is composed of people in the same age groups as were in the Stock and Thomas audiences. And I don't believe that... Uh, the, the level of musical knowledge, except as familiarity has been enhanced by listening to, listening to recordings and radio broadcasts, uh, except as far as those things are concerned, the, the musical content of their minds isn't very much different. So I don't think it's any, uh, it was any harder for them. I still uh, must hold to my previous point that the modern contemporary conductor now must project music that has so little emotional appeal uh, to untried ears that it's hard on him to make something of it. In one way, it's hard on him. In another way, however, it's easy on him because uh, it, it's not so difficult technically as a rule and doesn't require the extremely precise technical preparation that a Mozart symphony, for instance, requires. So there's some elements of, of difficulty, and there's some elements that uh, are easier. All in all, I, I suppose that every conductor in every generation has these problems, and I, I don't believe they're very much different now than they were previously. Uh, I'd like to develop one point you uh, just made, which I think would be interesting to our listeners. Uh, <clears throat> people think that because Mozart and Haydn, say, are so simple, uh, that uh, they're much uh, more... Uh, easily conducted 
than a composition, say, by uh, Stravinsky. Oh. And I've heard conductors say that Mozart is uh, the most difficult to conduct because everything is so transparent. Yes, that's true. It, it's extremely difficult to do it well. Of course, it's very easy to do it uh, just in a just to play a performance. But if you play a really beautiful performance of music that clear and transparent and as beautifully phrased and perfectly balanced as that music must be to be uh, a, a fine performance. That's a very difficult conductorial job. And as a matter of fact, when string players are auditioned uh, to get jobs in symphony orchestras, for instance, it's much easier for them to play a florid passage out of Tchaikovsky as an audition uh, stunt than it is for them to be given a page from a, a part from a Mozart symphony and be asked to read that at sight. And many of our best conductors uh, depend very, very much more upon what they hear from that Mozart part than they do uh, upon the candidate's rendition of the first movement of the Tchaikovsky Violin Concerto. Now, I'd like to throw another question in re uh, at you in regard to uh, contemporary uh, works. Uh, there's a good deal of criticism the length and breadth of the land about the number of uh, modern works that appear on the uh, symphony programs of uh, today. Uh, what, what is your feeling about the choice of contemporary works or the proportion, say, of contemporary works to the classic? Should we um, listen to contemporary works, all kinds of contemporary works? Is there any standard by uh, which conductors can choose or should choose uh, contemporary compositions? Well, yes, we'll just assume that all the conductors have high standards. Uh, maybe that's an assumption that not entirely justified in all cases. I would say this. I think that there is some uh, merit in the criticism of there being too much contemporary music, so-called, on our programs. I think it's based upon the fact that conductors have, haven't been discriminating as much as they should be. They have a sort of a, of a feeling that they should play contemporary music, that everything deserves a hearing. They get pressed for time and sometimes don't have a chance to study a score as thoroughly as they should. And so they uh, will allow to creep into their repertoires some pieces by contemporary composers which are not thoughtfully constructed and which don't really have merit and which are imitative of other contemporary composers and which load down our programs with things not only having very, not having very much musical merit, but which crowd out of that same program and that same repertoire some of the great pieces of music that, after all, are the sustaining lifeblood for our audiences. And of any part of a program, in other words, should uh, should not exactly be of educational value, but it should be of emotional nourishment. And if you give enough of that, then an audience will take together with that some education in addition. It's up to the conductor, however, to find compositions by contemporary composers which are good enough so that they can be rated as educational. I once heard a conductor say that um, he felt uh, time and time again that he was being insulted by the uh, type of compositions that were handed in to him by uh, hopeful uh, composers. Well, some of them are insulted. I've seen compositions myself, scores, sent in with uh, written in pencil, for instance, and with some of the instruments scored out of range. In other words, uh, notes written in for instruments that were, were either too high or too low for them to play. Scores in which uh, uh, a solo instrument was buried beneath such a mass of sound, as was obvious from looking at the score, that it couldn't be heard. All of those things. I, I'm not a technical enough musician myself to want to sound like a pundit on these things, but I do know from long experience and from many conversations with conductors that they are sometimes imposed upon by people who either don't know their jobs or who think that they've already acquired sufficient reputation so that they can throw together something on paper to get another performance. In fact, one of the worst uh, abuses of that latter thing that I was just mentioning is that we even have some composers who are so anxious for performances that they only need to be told how many minutes long their piece will be and they're quite happy to write you an overture lasting four minutes or one lasting eight minutes 
uh, or a symphony lasting 16 minutes or 24 minutes, depending on how much time you tell them they have. That isn't very compatible with inspiration, in my opinion. It's compatible with a desire to get a performance more. To buy music by the yard. Uh, <laughs> another, another well, sad to say, uh, some produce it by the yard. Uh, a few minutes ago, you mentioned something about um, auditions for prospective members of an orchestra and um, the relation of Mozart to uh, uh, Tchaikovsky as the basis for these auditions. I was wondering if uh, you could tell us something about <clears throat> the uh, choice of replacements in a symphony orchestra. There are always people retiring or leaving for one or another uh, reason, and the conductor always has to uh, find uh, replacements. Uh, how does he go about it? Uh, what are the standards? What are the methods? Uh, uh, how does a prospective uh, candidate get a hearing? Well, that's, there that's again... A, that's a multiple question. Out that there. is a multiple <laughs> question, and it asks me to be more of an expert than I probably am. Uh, but let's look at it this way. A modern symphony orchestra in a large city like Chicago or New York, Boston, uh, has around 100 to 105 players on its regular full-time payroll. If you uh, assume that the average life expectancy of orchestra playing of one of those players was 20 years, that would mean you'd have to have five replacements or so a year just uh, as a matter of time and as a matter of natural changeover. Uh, those replacements may come in any one of the many instruments that play in the orchestra. Now, conductors, if they're really experienced, uh, have a surprisingly uh, large acquaintance with the various players of various instruments, woodwind, string, and so on, all over the country. And they know before they begin auditioning about what uh, they're going to hear and they then have auditions, nevertheless, to get up-to-the-minute news and data on their candidates, usually inviting other persons in who play the same instruments, and the assistant conductor and so on to help audition, and they literally pick the man that can play the best for whatever new position they can, because every conductor constantly is trying to improve the quality of his instrument, and his instrument is the orchestra. There um, are, of course, uh, always some uh, uh, openings, and uh, where we always we've had for the last few years, every symphony has had uh, difficulty in filling uh, the string positions because there seems to be a dearth of uh, prospective string players and an uh, oversupply of uh, brass players. Well, wind players in general. Yeah, or wind players, I should say. Well, general. unfortunately, that's absolutely true. There are many reasons for it. Uh, one reason is that uh, most stringed instruments require very much more practice time and, and more years to learn to play proficiently enough to get into an orchestra with than do the wind instruments. I'm not, not uh, saying anything derogatory about wind instruments here, naturally. But uh, the, that fact and uh, other things that I'm afraid your motions indicate to me we haven't got time to discuss well, thanks ever so much, Dr. Oldberg, for this interesting 